Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Good, good afternoon. More people entered the room. Let's have a look. Everyone. Tomorrow. There we go. Folks are spilling in now. Twelve, not too bad. We got a couple more here. I'm going to give it another minute and then uh, we'll get started. Thirteen. Come on, give me two more. Let's get an even fifty percent. Hmm. I don't know, folks. I don't know if it's going to happen. Oh, there's one. One more. Come on. <laughs> okay well while i'm waiting i think that's oh there we go okay all right so that's liable to continue for the next couple of minutes but um uh i want to do something with you guys today that i started doing with my cinematography class one of my sections of cinematography uh, yesterday afternoon, which is let us practice um, having our video feeds on. Unless somebody really has a uh, serious objection to turning your camera on, I would love to see, here's one, all of your bright, shiny faces so I don't feel so alone. You don't have to have your audio turned on. You can keep that muted um, and just turn it on if you want to ask a question or offer some feedback. Um, but I think particularly in light of a sort of a workshop situation, I think it's appropriate that we all have our cameras turned on. I think it would be um, respectful for the participants and those who are seeking some feedback live. Um, and I think it's also a uh, good practice because um, this is part of your attendance grade, right? So um, one of my classes, I had a sneaking suspicion since nobody's cameras were on and nobody's microphones were live that I was talking to myself for 45 minutes. Um, and if that's the case, just understand that you know, you could get some test questions from something we talk about in a, in a lecture like this. So if you don't come to the live and you don't watch the video um, and then you come to me at the end of the semester and say, you don't understand why you didn't do well on your test, I'm going to tell you, well, you know, did you attend the lectures? Did you watch the videos? You know, that's when it's going to come home to roost, folks. You know, if you don't want to come and listen to my, you know, discussions uh that's up to you i'm not making it mandatory uh this time around i may make these mandatory next next semester or next year um we'll see how it goes i like the idea of 
giving people the freedom to operate under their own recognizance, right? Um, but, you know, checking in and turning off your camera and your microphone and then going into the living room to play video games, you're not participating and you shouldn't get credit for that kind of behavior. So um, I'm not saying that you guys are doing it because you guys give me pretty good turnout every week. We got 17 people. That's better than half of the class. So um, I'm very happy with that. Um, but in this case, I think it's more about the folks that are sharing should have the benefit of, you know, seeing everyone uh, who's given the feedback. So if your camera's not on already, please turn it on for this session uh, and I'll begin. Um, what about people with internet issues? Because like if I turn my video on, it literally will freeze the whole screen. Do you have like a, well, yeah. So like, like the issue, is the yeah. video, if I turn my video on, it's upload. And so it's doing upload and download at the same time, which is what causes it to freeze. I'm going to say in your case, since you're pretty active in these sessions and you ask a lot of questions or have feedback, um, and I know that you're there and present and, and you're participating, if you have a bandwidth issue, um, what can we do, right? But, you know, I don't want to insist that you do something that's going to crash your uh, participation in the session. So if somebody has an extenuating circumstance like that, um, you know, we'll go with it. But if you have the ability to turn on your camera, I would appreciate it if you did so. Okay. Having said that, I lost my place. Um, I wanted to... <laughs> I wanted to um, give you just a quick uh, couple of announcements and a quick little uh, um, keynote. And then I wanna jump right into some, some nice feedback for folks who are uh, generously going to offer their, uh, their work for discussion. Um, let me just check the room one more time. Okay, all right. Sharing my screen now. And let's bring up, okay. So here we are. So it's week four. Um, I wanted to remind everybody again that we will have um, Betty Goldberg on Thursday. Um, she is a uh, writer in Los Angeles um, ha with uh, television writing uh, and directing experience. Um, and I thought she would be a neat person to bring in and um, ask a few questions of her and offer you folks the ability to communicate with somebody from the business, maybe ask some of your own questions. I would encourage you to prepare some questions maybe in advance, not, not a lot, you know. I have given her already um, a sheet of questions that I've prepared uh, in the event that we experience audience timidity on the day. Um, but I really think if you, you know, if you can muster the courage to speak to this woman directly and ask her some questions, it could be very much to your benefit. So I just want to remind you of that. That's on Thursday. Um, and then today, I really just wanted to slow it all down. Um, you folks still have two outstanding assignments um, that you can turn in as late as uh, Friday, beat sheets and character dossiers. Your um, treatments should be in with me already, and I think they all are at this point. Um, so uh, I just wanted to sort of slow it down and talk about those documents a little bit more, see what some folks are dealing with in terms of issues or have questions or whatever. Um, and then uh, we can move forward from there. Uh, I'm driving home, home right now, no camera, we'll be home in 15. That's great, that's fine, no worries. Um, okay, so I have an announcement, very interesting. Uh, I don't know if you folks are aware of this organization, it's the UFVA, the University Film and Video Association. Um, it is a national organization. Um, a number of your teachers that you are currently working with are probably members of the UFVA. Uh, I know uh, for one in particular, uh, Tim Ritter is involved 
uh, you may have had him or will have him for a directing class or a, um, I think he also has a writing class occasionally. Um, I uh, was a member, my membership has expired and I have to renew it, you know, but I will be doing that. Um, and you can join as a student as well. Um, I think it's like $20 annually. Yeah, for student membership. Um, and it's interesting because I, I just got this document in my email uh, late this morning. And it is a call for submissions for their 2021 um, sort of uh, uh, creative conference. It's virtual this year, so it'll be all online. Um, we were supposed to have the 2020 uh, UFVA uh, National Conference here in Orlando. Um, and because of COVID, it got canceled and it, and it went to online. And apparently 2021 will stay online as well. Um, so, you know, there's no travel to any interesting places to participate this year, but that's okay. Um, more importantly, uh, is that you can submit a number of things to this uh, to this event, and I had a tab here. Let me see if it's uh, still open. Um, nope, I blew it. So I'm going to open it again. Um, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Is it here? Oh, I know where it is. Here. There we go. So this is their homepage. Um, and this is uh, uh, where you would go to like join up and stuff. It has information on membership. Um, they also have like job postings or job boards on their uh, websites. They have um, links and creative resources. They've got current events and news information on the 2021 conferences here. Okay. And you can see that they have a number of categories for submission. So um, if you wanted to submit, for instance, a short story uh, or a manuscript, you can do that here. Uh, single topic papers they're looking for. Uh, you can submit scripts for feedback and for competition. Uh, you can submit films uh, for screening and they will uh, quantify and qualify every submission based on a set of their own criteria. Um, and then they will have uh, presentations and so forth uh, on the day. This uh, conference this year, I'm trying to see what the date is. Yeah, July. So you've got, there's quite a bit of time here. Um, submissions will probably be open for uh, a couple of weeks yet. Um, and the conference is in July. So they'll make all their, you know, their selections and everything from the submissions in the interim uh, and have a presentation for July. Uh, it's interesting. Um, I know teachers at other universities that are also members of this. I know teachers from other universities who have been placed uh, through the job boards at uh, UFVA. Um, it's a pretty integral part of the community. And if you haven't uh, checked them out, I would suggest it. UFVA.org is the website. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Um, it can be helpful and it's, you know, it's one possible way for you to get some exposure uh, for some of your work if you have no other sort of venues to pursue at this point. Um, you can also get inf uh, in interesting feedback and stuff on some of your written work. You can also get feedback incidentally, don't forget about um, the, uh, um, the UK website that I gave you guys a couple of weeks ago, um, Script Revolution, uh, because you can use that as a feedback form as well. Feedback is really, really important. That's why we're doing it today for, uh, you know, again, because uh, I think that's one of the purest forms of honest feedback that you can get, uh, especially from your peers and other writers um, to, to help you, you know, with your technique to advance your, your ability uh, and get you better at what you do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the hero's journey, and then I'm going to get right into the workshop. I have some PDFs for you to look at. Uh, Dramatica, I was going to cover it in class, but I decided to bring Betty in instead. Um, so you can look at it. I'm really not going to tap into Dramatica much. Um, uh, Chris Vogler is in there, and we've already looked at his story structure um, theory. Uh, basic three-act structure is in there. 
Um, and there's some other variations on story structure uh, ideas. <clears throat> some of them are very complex and some of them are fairly simple in their approach. Um, but I don't want to confuse the issue. If you have, if you've got a good sense of three act structure with maybe the six stages from Pete Russell or uh, the 12 uh, stages of the hero's journey from Joseph Campbell and Chris Vogler, I think you got a pretty firm basis and understanding about story structure and a good place to start. So I don't want to start muddying the water by giving you too many different structures to think about uh, because it's not, you know, it's, it's not essential in your writing that you um, go anything really beyond the three act structure with maybe the six stages from Pete Russell or the, you know, the Chris Vogler method of, of adapting the hero's journey. If you go, if you don't go any further than those two structure theories, uh, I think you could still be very successful because most of Hollywood is written based on those two things. I've also given you the um, 36 dramatic situations from uh, Carlo, uh, Carlos Gozzi um, and, and well, or also Georges uh, Politi, um, uh, a couple of French theorists uh, from the early, late 18th, early 19th, no, that's not right, er, late 19th, early 20th centuries, um, theories on the dramatic situation. Uh, I gave you a text by Tobias called 20 Master Plots, right? And so that was written in 1994. Um, and it's really a derivative theory from this 36 dramatic situations, um, which was compiled by these guys, uh, Gozi and, and, and Gottlieb, uh, around uh, 1915, it was published. Uh, and it stretches back theoretically back to, um, uh, to uh, Greek legends and parables. Okay, so it stretches back quite a ways. Um, and I think it's interesting if you take a look at it and maybe compare it to the table of contents of Tobias, you can kind of see where um, where Tobias in his 20 master plots has sort of uh, uh, maybe combined a couple of the uh, theoretical situations uh, presented by Gozi um, to make it a little simpler uh, to follow. Um, because then, of course, if you if you use the document the way it's kind of designed, you're mixing and matching these these 20 or 36 situations anyway, to come up with your unique, um, your unique storylines. So uh, if you're starting with fewer building blocks, I think it, it makes it a little easier. Um, but whichever, so whichever list uh, you embrace, um, I, I think it's interesting. It's, it's a, it's a fairly quick read. It's, it's, you know, five pages. I pulled it off of uh, uh, Wikipedia and um you know, I think it's informative, and they cite uh, the author of the story structure architect. They 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 uh, reference uh, Dr. Schmidt uh, in her work uh, contributing to the article about the thirty six situations. Check it out in the PDF. It's downloadable on Web Courses. Um, I popped a couple of videos up on Web Courses for you as well to check out. Um, we're workshopping today, um, and then. Um, I'm going to say, you know, disregard this assignment here. It's not on web courses, but it's in my uh, keynote here uh, about um, watching TV and applying the Sid Field approach. I think we'll skip that stage at this point. I'd really rather hear about how your documents are coming along. But I will say this about the hero with a thousand faces. So I've given you this, this book in PDF form on your bookshelf as well. Um, and this is a pretty uh, standard reference for a lot of writers. Okay, so um, you're going to find the hero's journey, you know, portions of it outlined in here. Uh, it's certainly in here. Uh, in the writer's journey, this is one of the books that almost every writer in Hollywood has on their bookshelf. Okay. Um, the art of dramatic writing. Okay, this is another uh, trusted manuscript. Uh, by writers in Hollywood, by a number of writers, especially TV writers. Uh, Lahush also references the hero's journey. Okay, so a lot of these uh, instruments that I've given you for reference and for assistance in your research and in your in your uh, content creation uh, is using this theory as as a foundation. Okay, and it's really just a model, right? So it's it's something. It's a jumping off point. 
Okay, it's a place for you to begin thinking about your story, what you want your heroes to to go through. Um, if you're writing a one-off, like a feature script, you might have a pretty good idea what your story is already, okay? And so you don't need to start completely from scratch like this. But I think if you're writing for TV and every week you have to have a new scenario and every, you know, every uh, quarter or every six months you, you have another, uh, you know, front nine, back nine uh, situation, maybe like The Walking Dead where you got nine episodes in the spring and another nine in the fall or 12 and 12 or 10 and 10, whatever it is, uh, um, you know, and so you've got to keep coming up with these stories, right? You know, we can all have a bad day here, here and there, right? Where you're just not real inspired. And so that's where a, a document like this really starts pay, paying for itself. Because uh, if you have to continually come up with scenarios for your characters, and especially if you're on a deadline, you know, or if you're on a broadcast, uh, schedule, um, you know, where you have uh, prep and then uh, production of your stories of your scripts for, te for television. This can this can help you a lot. I mean, sometimes you just don't know, you know, you draw a blank, I don't know what this guy's going to do this week, you know, and even in uh, even in a writer's room, you can you can, you know, have a little bit of that sort of malaise. So that's that's where these documents really come in handy. Um, they're not really a crutch, they're just there to help you, you don't have to use it. But it is there, it is effective, and it has been the basis for many, many stories, uh, scripted stories in Hollywood for, you know, a very long time, at least since the 50s when he uh, offered this theory uh, for the first time. So uh, check it out if you haven't already. Um, the Heroic Way, The Hero's Path um, is offering a depth of insight and it's offering context, meaning for your characters within their story structure. Okay, so it's attentive to guidelines, it's attentive to um, uh, uh, iconic or um, uh, um, yeah, iconic characters or character types, right? Um, it's, a, it's your literal journey of your hero, it's your symbolic journey of your hero, I should say, or your heroine. Um, and it's, um, it, it's, it's there to help you stay on point and not get wrapped up in, you know, uh, in the complexities of the moment and, and sort of lose sight of the overall objective. I think a good example of this uh, might be the, the Hobbit installments, the Peter Jackson Hobbit stories, because not only did he take, a, you know, a single concept and break it up into three movies, but I think there were some distinct moments especially in the second and, and certainly in the third installment, uh, where it seemed like we were way far afield from the book and what, you know, Frodo's journey was and, and, and the conflict with smog and, and, and what that represented. Uh, and we got sort of embroiled in a lot of stuff that seemed like a minutia that wasn't really contributing uh, to the overall story. And I think that part of the reason for that was to fill time and I think the other part of it is, is, you know, that's, I think that's when a script writer loses sight of their character's real arc and journey, right? It wasn't about, you know, Legolas fighting orcs in that story. In fact, in the books, Legolas doesn't even appear, right? Uh, he doesn't come in until the Lord of the Rings. So uh, to have Legolas in The Hobbit, you know, is already, you know, deviating from the original con uh, 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 story material. Um, but it's losing sight of the real purpose of that story, which was it was it was about um, stepping out into a larger world, leaving the safety of your bubble. It was about um, fro uh, about Bilbo's conflict with smog. It was about it was about the notion of smog. Smog was a was a um, a, uh, a a metaphorical representation, right? He wasn't just a bad dragon sleeping on a pile of gold. He was a metaphor for other things. So when you start interrupting that story arc and those objectives of Bilbo's hero's journey with a lot of action and a lot of weirdness with Legolas and, and, and orcs, I think you've lost sight of your, of your structure. Um, so I think it's valuable sometimes to rely on these tools. Um, and Clarissa Estes, you know, this is her quote basically from her book, coming through struggles causes the person to be infused with more vision and to be strengthened by the spiritual life or principle 
uh, more than anything else, it encourages somebody to take uh, take the first step, have the courage to live their life of authenticity uh, with, she, she uses the terms of frontery uh, and metal, right? So not being afraid of confrontation and, and showing your, um, your uh, mental and physical toughness, right? Your metal. Um, so it's just there to help you um, mold and shape your characters and, and guide them on their journey. And I think that, you know, Bruce Willis's character uh, in Die Hard is a classic example of a character that's definitely on a journey, right? So he starts the movie feeling empowered and, you know, um, but he's hurt. He's got a wound. His wife has left him to move to the West Coast to take a job working for a corporation. He's a beat cop from, I think he's supposed to be from New York or New Jersey. And um, he goes from feeling self-actualized uh, to feeling abandoned and then to feeling remorseful. Uh, he flies out West to apologize and try to make amends with his wife and try to, you know, offer the option of a, of a new life. And then he's confronted with this inciting incident, which throws him into uh, a state of confusion for a while. Um, and in dealing with this incident that has occurred, uh, not only does he reestablish his, his validity within himself, uh, but he reestablishes a, um, a, a, a meaningful and productive relationship with his wife. He, re he restores that relationship uh, based on, on better things in the end, uh, openness and trust. Whereas in the beginning, she accuses him of you know, internalizing and, and bringing the work home, but never sharing. Uh, and by the end of the movie, you know, he's, he's very open and honest with her and she understands more about him. And it's, uh, he, he has a pretty amazing arc uh, in the context of that story. Um, and so the notion here is that uh, a deeply flawed and conflicted hero goes on a journey and they must transform or perish metaphorically. Okay, perish metaphorically. So meaning they don't necessarily have to physically die, uh, but they fail miserably. And so they, they do not fulfill their mission or their, or their goal, right? Campbell's basis for his book, The Hero's Journey, is the result of a lot of research and a lot of um, uh, comparative vetting of documents and manuscripts, written written um, stories and objects uh, over the years to see how they conform to his theory of a hero's journey. And so he's drawing on oral traditions, fairy tales, legends and parables, religious texts and iconography, folk music, art, poetry, pop music, literature and ultimately movies okay and i just picked this um uh this interesting sort of little serif off of the walls at uh, lesco in in uh, france um, these are the earliest known illustrations created by human beings um in the in the world on planet earth um and they are um many many um at this point if i'm not mistaken these are over a million years old um, and they represent uh, human beings' earliest attempts at describing their world and maybe telling stories about that world, right? And this is a story about hunting, you know, and it's showing, you know, a male uh, out in the world hunting and managing uh, the wildlife. Uh, and it's a depiction of, uh, it's a story of hunting and gathering, right? Um, and it's painted on a wall uh, in a cave in France. So um, this is uh, part of Joseph Campbell's thesis, which is the hero's journey has been a part of our, uh, first our oral traditions and then our written and, and, and other traditions as far back as humanity goes. That it's kind of a pattern that we've established and we base our, 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 our literature of all of all forms on a structure similar to the hero's journey. And so we looked at this uh, um, analysis. This is the three act structure uh, with the hero's journey uh, from Campbell and 
uh, Vogler superimposed on it. Okay, starting in the ordinary world and ending with the return of the hero and the return with the what he calls the elixir. And the elixir can have many forms. It can be knowledge, it can be an artifact, it can be um, an individual, uh, you know, um, the elixir can have many meanings and take many forms. Um, it's basically the introduction of um, a new way or an enlightened way uh, or an improvement on uh, the world uh, as it previously existed. It represents, or it's some metric that, rep it, it represents some metric of change from the original world to uh, the resulting world uh, at the end of the story. Okay, so elixir is a fairly nebulous term and it has a very broad uh, application in this case. Um, we can add Vogler, we can superimpose Vogler over the top of that three act structure. And what he tries to do is clarify what's happening in each stage of the hero's journey. So we start in the ordinary world in act one, and this is where we say our hero has a limited awareness, only the awareness of that world as it currently exists. And then something has to happen. In Campbell, it's a call to an adventure. And so this presents an opportunity for increased awareness. The hero may refuse the call, reluctant to change. Then they start thinking better of it. And without making a snap judgment, they meet with the mentor right, which is overcoming fear. Um, at that point, they may decide to move forward. That's where we get our story from. This is crossing the threshold. The willingness of leaving behind the comfort of your bubble for the prospect of adventure and a broader understanding of something, your world, yourself, um, you know, uh, your economic or social standing, whatever it is, you're seeking to improve by embarking on or embracing the journey, right? And think about, uh, you know, in in either case, The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, right? Uh, the Both of those series open the same way with Bilbo making a choice, right? In The Hobbit, Bilbo is introduced to dwarves for the first time and he is given the, the notion of a bigger, broader world, and he has to be coaxed onto an adventure where he's going to be the burglar, right? And he doesn't realize, I don't think in the very beginning that he's gonna confront Smog ultimately. Uh, he just knows that he's being hired to go in and steal something for these dwarves. Um, and at the beginning of the Lord of the Rings, he has to be coaxed out the door as well, but without his ring. So it's a different kind of um, journey he's going on. He's going on a journey of um, um, not supplication, but uh, on, on deliverance perhaps from the corruption of the ring. Um, and he has to be coaxed out the door without it. Um, so it's kind of you know the same pattern repeating itself just with sort of different story elements and, and ultimately a different uh, objective. But you can kind of see how you can take this and map it over, maybe, you know, maybe take your favorite movie um, and see if you can superimpose this story structure over the top of your favorite film and see how closely that film corresponds to these stages or these, um, these objectives in each of those stages and see if it follows a, you know, a classic three act structure or not. Uh, to help you with that concept, I have put in web courses, um, in fact, I think I can show you, this thing snakes on for uh, quite a ways in, uh, in the website, uh, in web courses. It is, um, let's go to here. Let's go to, no, let's go here. And I'm gonna go to, see if I can figure out what I did with it. Um, let's go to modules. And I think, yeah, The Hero's Journey in six popular movies, okay? And it has, uh, for this demonstration, it's using Harry Potter, uh, the original Star Wars installment, uh, The Matrix. Uh, I believe this is the first Spider-Man, the first, um, 
uh, you know, the original uh, Spider-Man, uh, the Lion King and the Lord of the Rings. And if you follow this sort of undulating diagram, it's showing you each step of the way what what uh, landmark or what what milestone you're passing. So here's the ordinary world transitioning into the call to adventure, transitioning into a refusal of the call, uh, meeting with the mentor, crossing the threshold, tests of allies and enemies, approach to the innermost cave, which is a metaphor, uh, the ordeal presented to the hero, the reward for success, the road back, and the resurrection, the transformation of the hero. And in each step of the way, it's telling you in each one of these films what's taking place at the time. So if you look at Star Wars, The Ordinary World in the beginning is Luke Skywalker living on Tatooine. His call to adventure is R2-D2 gives Luke a message from Princess Leia uh, searching for Obi-Wan. His refusal of the call is uh, he doesn't want to take Obi-Wan to Alderaan. Um, so he meets with the mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, gives Luke his father's lightsaber and talks about Darth Vader and his relationship to Luke's father. Crossing the threshold is Luke accompanies Obi-Wan first to uh, Mos Eisley and then ultimately to uh, Alderaan. Uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca are uh, the newly acquired allies um, and they confront the uh, Death Star. Uh, Death Star destroys Alderaan. Uh, this is an approach to the innermost cave. This is a transition, okay, which is going to lead to a, a bigger ordeal. So it's almost like an inciting event that escalates to the group now must rescue Leia and get away so they can regroup on, uh, where did they go? The End Endor? Is it? End no, not Endor. Yavin, right? They have to go to Yavin and regroup because the Death Star is, is ultimately going to follow them. Uh, the payoff, Luke decides to join the rebels and destroy the Death Star. He succeeds. Han Solo helps. Uh, they overcome the, the Empire, and Luke remembers Obi-Wan's advice, and he uses the Force to help him destroy the Death Star. But really, I think the resurrection is when Luke learns to uh, truly understand the Force and learns how to embrace it to help him resolve his situation. I think that's a transforming point, right? It's the point where he shuts off his targeting computer, and he's going to he's going to guide his missiles into the Death Star with the force instead of using the technology, right? I think that marks his transformation. Uh, and then he returns with the elixir. So Luke wins a medal and takes the first steps towards becoming a Jedi. His elixir is um, the acquisition of knowledge, right? A true embracing and uh, his beginning uh, sense of mastering the force and how to use it um, uh, to accomplish things. So if you if you if you do that with your favorite movie, it'd be interesting to see how closely your your favorite films are adhering to this sort of um, uh, this theory. I'd be interested in knowing. Um, I have three videos for you, but I'm not going to show them to you here. Um, but they're pretty interesting. I think you'll find uh, value in them. Um, one of them is George Lucas uh, at a uh, he's at a, a symposium, but Charlie Rose is there to interview him, and he talks about the meaning behind Star Wars. Um, for context, I have Joseph Campbell uh, in an interview with, um, I forget his name, this was off of PBS, uh, talking about mythology and how, and how the hero's journey fits over the uh, story structure of Star Wars. Um, and then we have uh, from the Academy of Ideas, uh, another angle on Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey myth. Um, and it's comparing uh, mythology and religion, comparative mythology and religion. All three of these are very interesting videos. They're, none of them are very long particularly, um, but they might help you uh, gain some insight on uh, this useful structure technique. And then your reading assignment will be chapter one from the hero's journey. Uh, which is archetypes, heroes, mentors, wise men and women, okay? So that's my quick and dirty presentation. So what I'd like to do now is I want to address some workshopping. And I already have one volunteer. Uh, Miss Natalia Rojas has graciously offered to submit to our critique 
her document. Um, Natalia, do you want to uh, read this to us? Should I read it to uh, the class? Should we go over it together and I'll just sort of uh, read it for you or would you like to do it yourself? Yeah, you can read it, whatever is fine. Okay, but what I'd like to do, so we'll see how this goes. We'll feel it out, right? Um, I think that um, we'll take a look at each section and then sort of maybe take questions, see how that works. Um, so the top sheet is, I, I think it's mostly asking questions about structure. So uh, because the premise inspires the protagonist's journey, what is your revised script premise? And you have indicated that a free life is not where you can have it all, but one where you can feel and think for yourself. Um, we had uh, a section on premise, the very first section in the class. So let's just look at that for a second. What do you think of that premise? A free life is not where you can have anything you want, but you are free to make choices and think for yourself within the context of a range of choices. Does that seem like a solid premise to everyone? Somebody jump in there. This is a workshop. At the beginning, I was kind of struggling because I didn't know how to like write it. And I wrote like different versions of it. And then um, I went to the, the sheet that you posted us, the, the one of the, um, with the premises examples. Mm -hmm. So I was guided through that like um, page that you gave us. I think this is a very salient statement. And I think it is a valid premise because it is steeped in current events, especially now, especially after January 6th, right? So there are going to be, there are going to be people um, in the community in the broadest sense that we refer to as the United States, there are going to be people in the community who agree with the actions taken and agree with the claims made by the group that attacked the Capitol. And there are individuals who are uh, diametrically opposed to the ideal and the individuals who attacked the Capitol. Both groups are claiming free speech is at the crux of their ideological confrontation. And so we are now forced in the new millennium to or offered the opportunity, if you want to think about it that way, uh, to redefine as a culture our notions of free speech and what free speech means. And so free speech has been a topic of debate among philosophers for hundreds of years. Okay, the founding fathers who constructed the Constitution were borrowing theories and philosophies from uh, from Descartes and from Voltaire and from uh, some of these early uh, French uh, philosophers from the 18th and 17th centuries who were debating things like what is what does free speech mean? You know, does free speech mean you can say anything you want anytime you want? Or are there social norms attached to the notion of what you should say, regardless of whether you have the legally uh, the legal ability to say it, do we or should we enforce social norms that will narrow the definition of free speech? And the obvious example that everybody always gives is, is it ethically right to yell fire in a crowded theater, right? If there's a fire, perhaps, but if there's not, and you're just doing it to incite panic or to get your jollies from watching people um, and their knee-jerk reactions or their panic reactions to being uh, ill-equipped or ill-prepared to deal with an immediate need. Uh, just because free speech is protected in this country, does that mean that you shouldn't be arrested for inciting uh, an incident by calling out fire in a crowded theater, right? So this is a, this is a quintessential question uh, that's been debated for a very long time. Okay, and so the question that's in current events, obviously, is 
yes, you have a right to disagree with the government. And yes, you have the legal and constitutional right to gather and to protest. But social norms have been imposed on our behaviors, which require permits for social gatherings of large numbers of individuals. Those permits have to be approved. And then, of course, free speech and expression does not extend to one's right to destroy public property or destroy the belongings, property, health, or welfare of other individuals in the process of your discontentment, right? So I think that this premise is pretty rock solid. Um, the question is how, in a broader context, are we going to apply it to her story? Does, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think we don't know what her story is yet, so it's a little hard to say how we should apply it. Doesn't yeah. matter what her story is. What I'm asking you is, is this premise uh, valid as a premise? <laughs> Na Natalia, you had a comment? Yeah, I was about to say that uh, before like reading uh, the, the dose here, I was wondering if you guys want me like to read uh, my synopsis so you guys know what the story is about. Yeah, let's do it. So um, there's some obvious questions being asked here. Is the protagonist's inner journey reflected? Amanda is discovering that life is not all about having everything she wants. The protagonist's goal then is finding her true self, knowing who Amanda really is and what she really likes or wants. Uh, the antagonist opportunity is money and power. That's a little broad, excuse me, a little broad. So let's, yeah. let's hear your synopsis and see can, how you're tying those things together, I think. Yeah, maybe I confused that um, that question with the following one, because in the next one, I explain it a little bit more, but okay. like, Would I'm you go ahead and read for you the synopsis. Go ahead, yeah. Amanda is a girl who has everything. She comes from a very wealthy family and has what it seems to be the perfect life. After a night of blackout, she wakes up at a rehab center where she checked herself in while drunk. After a failed attempt to prove that this was a mistake, the doctors insist that she must remain there at least two weeks. After some time there, Amanda realizes her previous life was empty. For this reason, she's looking desperately to remain there longer, confronting her family, the doctors, and her friends. What do you think, folks? I think that's a good synopsis. Sorry. I think that's a good synopsis. I think it you putting her in the rehab center over the course of two weeks, even though she didn't mean to check herself in there, I think it provides a lot of opportunity to open up some really interesting and some really detailed characters, like the people that she encounters while she's there. So I think it could be a really cool story. Thanks. I also agree because I peer reviewed this um, one when we did the peer review, and I was telling you how I really like the story and I feel like if you were to make this a comedy there's so many different ways you could go with it but also making it serious thank you anybody else uh, have any observations about this yeah um hearing what the synopsis is and everything this sounds like it could be like a, a coming of age type story uh just based on you know uh, she's realizing that what her life was before isn't was empty and now she's trying to find something different in her life. Like to me, that has some strong coming of age vibes. Let's do something real quick. Let's take a look at the uh, three act structure. And uh, let's see if I can pull it up here in my presentation. Um, let's go back to this diagram and see yeah, well, yeah, we can use Vogler because I, I like these sort of prompts down at the bottom that Vogler gives. It helps add context, I think. So, okay, in act one, we have our hero and she, so she wakes up in the uh, infirmary. In a we, rehab center. So we have no sense of story prior to her waking up from her blackout. Oh yeah, we do. We definitely do. Like, um, I think about the first episode as her breaking up with her boyfriend, which makes her get drunk in the first place. 
Okay. So you've provided the ordinary world in your, so this is a TV series and you, and you've constructed a pilot episode. Yeah. Where she's like, where we set up like her entire context. She has like this beautiful apartment she lives like with her mom, with her dad. She had like the perfect boyfriend, the perfect friends, but like his boyfriend breaks up with her out of nowhere. And then the antagonist, like her best friend, uh, is like, okay, let's go out and let's have a drink. But that drink turns into like a night of blackout where uh, her best friend puts her in a, in a taxi and then she wakes up at the rehab center. So that will be like the pilot episode where we see where she comes from and like her context and these phony, you know, like friendship. So, yeah. Oh, that's terrific. So I, so I'm here in ordinary world. Um, I think her call to adventure is actually going to happen when she technically at the end, right at the end of the episode, which is Act Three, technically, um, because her call to action then is what is to get sober, right? Is there any other? Um, well, her call to adventure might be her friend coaxing her out to go drinking. That might be the first one, right? So what we might have is sort of a symbolic loop happening here, or we have an ironic reference in Act Three to her call to adventure in Act One. So getting coaxed out to drink with her friend, I guess we can call that her call to adventure. Um, does she refuse the call? No. Not really. <laughs> And here's the thing about this, you don't have to have all 12, right? Which is why some theoreticians are coming up with like nine act structures and, you know, the six stages of a three act structure because it's been clearly stated. Uh, and I think that Vogler says it in the writer's journey. I think he says that you don't have to have every step along the way. It's not, that's not the point. The point is, does, do you have enough of these that give the story a sense of arc and flow, right? So she doesn't refuse the call. How about meeting with the mentor? Well, she wakes up at the rehab center and she's like, I'm not an alcoholic, right? So this all was a mistake. Like her in her drunkness, she's like, she's so sad because due to her breakup that she's like you know what i need to be at rehab but it's not like she's an alcoholic yeah so this, is a, this is a cyclical thing i think you're right that's act three though so in act one is she going out drinking with the girlfriend and the girlfriend is going to be her sounding board it's going to listen to all of her anxiety and that unhappiness and try to help her feel better, because that could be symbolically an example of meeting with the mentor as well. Well, or did it just go I, off the deep end? I think of the I think of the mentor as one of the patients that is already at the rehab center. Okay. Which is the one who will bring, you know, light to her life and that will show her that life is not a all about having the best things of you know like having a wonderful apartment or having the best clothes you know so i picture the mentor as someone that is already in the rehab center yeah that, that's for sure i think um okay let's move on let's see what we got here so crossing the threshold uh committing to uh the journey um, I think is symbolically represented by the fact that she went out for like two drinks and stayed all night. So that's kind of committing to the notion of getting soused, I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> Experimenting, maybe, maybe not. Tests of allies and enemies, I don't know. Does anything happen in the bar? Does anything happen in the process of drinking that would represent this? Yeah, definitely. I think that there are two moments um first like of course um her her best friend is the one who puts her in a taxi like all alone she was already drunk she was like 
Great. That's uh, definitely a test of an ally. Yeah. And then also once she like in her very first of of in the re at the rehab center, she's like lost, you know? She's like, what's going on? But at the end of the day, like last minute, like um, of visits and, and stuff, her mom calls. Her mom calls and she's like, yo, what happened? Like, why are you there? That's and showing like, it the consequences. That's the, well, C Campbell calls it the reward, but in this case, it's not a reward, it's a rebuke. So, but it does represent consequences and that's fairly consistent. So that that's good. We're, we're moving yeah, that, along pretty good. That moment, like in her first day, like her, her parents didn't even go. They just called her like, what happened to see what happened. Mm -hmm. And then her mom is like, okay, okay. If I have a moment during my week, I'll go and see you. And that brings her down. And after that, like um, falling to say, per se. Okay, so um, he meets like with this person that is already in the rehab and he's like, yo, look, like he tries to approach to her, you know, mm -hmm. in, a, in a very interesting way. Like he starts reading her a book. She's, he's not like approaching her like, oh, everything will be fine. No, he's like reading a book and he starts reading that book to her. And that kind of gets her like, huh, interesting. And she started talking with him about the book. And then he, she notices that she's actually smart. That she's not like the dumb girl that only uh, wears Prada and goes to the best clubs. Of the this season. is terrific because I think that's totally rededication. That's the road back, right? She went out drinking with a friend. She took it too far. She blacked out, woke up in the hospital meet somebody who convinces her that she is not a lost cause. She has things to offer that she might not be aware of on her own or that she's not convinced of. And so that's the road back to self. Exactly. She lost herself by going out, getting drinking and blacking out. And she regains herself or her notion of herself as she pursues the road back and the road back will be represented. I'm assuming by each of these subsequent episodes where she gains a little more power back or a little bit more understanding of self. Does that it's, seem like your objective? Definitely is definitely that. And what I like about this is that it's going is like, he approaches her genuinely. It's more like, oh, everything's going to be fine. You're pretty and you're smart. No, no, no. Like, he wants her to discover that by herself, by putting little things. Like, if he was the one that puts the clues, and then she's the one that figures, figures it out. Yes. And now here's an interesting thing. In one of his interviews, uh, Vince Gilligan talks about... Um, writing for characters for television and how his character walt walt white um is um he's a he's a tragic hero he's a he's an antagonistic hero and over the course of five seasons he he has this story that goes like this like this like this but the arc of the character doesn't follow the same undulating plot. This is the roller coaster ride that uh, Dr. Schmidt talks about in the story structure architect. The plot is doing this, but Walter White is doing this and then he plateaus for four seasons, right? And the idea is when you're writing for television, if you want your show to go five seasons, do you necessarily want your character to heal or do you need them to be perpetually in a state of discovery, a state of failure and redemption? Do they want to go through a cyclical state of trial and error? And then ultimately maybe in your, cum in your, in your culminating season, you might allow that character to succeed or fail. Mm -hmm. I think, 
man, I mean, I think that's your story is a great example of how it's fitting in here. Not every stage is represented and not every stage has to be represented. But we had ordinary world call to adventure. We had meeting the mentor. We have crossing the threshold. We have an ordeal. Uh, we have consequences. We have the road back. Resurrection is promised in episode two or, you know, consecutive episodes after the pilot that's here at least at least the promise of resurrection and therefore there is also a promise of an elixir which is ultimately when she gets out of rehab and she's healed the elixir will be her her reestablished whole emotionally healthy self and the knowledge that uh Yes, she was free to go out drinking and it wasn't illegal. She was of legal age. She had an ID and she went to a bar and bought the, the alcohol from a licensed vendor. But just because you can do all those things doesn't mean you should drink 12 scotch and sodas because you might end up blacking out and then there will be consequences that your character will have to reconcile. And so actually, it's funny. I think it's a great job because this like this story is inspired on a friend of mine that he got so drunk that he checked himself on a rehab center and the doctors told him like you have to stay here two weeks at least so yeah he kind of <laughs> so that's great so so you've done research you have real physical uh, experience with these topics and then I think, and I maybe we'll maybe we'll pose this question to the group. I think I can think of at least three popular uh, two TV is it two no two movies and one TV show that follow this master plot. And this master plot could either be redemption. Okay, if we look at, for instance. Um, let's look at the PDF I gave you of the 36 dramatic situations. Let's see if I can find it really quick or if it's going to be a problem. Um, bur, 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 bur. New tab. Let's look at PDFs from this week. 36 dramatic situations and oh it's opening trying to open there it is okay what have we got supplication no um christ to pontius pilate is a iconic example of the supplication storyline deliverance might be one of your themes um what else have we got? Disaster, perhaps. Falling prey to misfortune, for sure. Uh, a daring enterprise, nah, not so much, because this is a morality tale. Abduction, mm -hmm. nah. Enigma, no. Obtaining, maybe over time, sure. Over the course of the series, mm -hmm. she's obtaining what? She's obtaining physical and mental health. Um, enmity with kin, no, she's not. Uh, rivalry with kin, no. Murder, no. Madness, no. Fatal imprudence, no. Nobody dies, right? In your story, nobody dies. The mentor dies. The met. Oh, okay. Well, but that, but that's not part of her story structure. That is something that impacts her story structure. So it's not seventeen. Yeah. We have at least three of the classic thirty-six ordeals, according to Gotti, that qualify your story. So, um. Mm -hmm. Self-sacrifice for an ideal, getting clean, maybe. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Nobody has anything to offer. Nothing. Nailed no them all. Say again. Still reading. <laughs> I think he kind of nailed them all. I didn't do it. Gotti did it. But yeah, I mean, my, my whole point is, is it's there, right? So 
if you, for instance, Natalia, if you were in the midst of, you know, creating your story and you felt like you were in a bind, right? Like, mm-hmm. man, I don't know, you know, what's this character going through? What, what am I going to do to show this care, you know, show this character, do this thing or go to yeah. this place or whatever, or what, where do I go from here? You know, sometimes these structures can help you in that respect because they can, they can pick up where you where you've left off, or they can give you a suggestion of what that true outcome might be, or give you a classic example of the of what the outcome might be. So your story resonates. One of the things I think personally that makes contemporary stories as successful as they are is that either they're so fresh that we've just never heard that idea before, which is super rare. Um, but moreover, I think what makes something successful is that it resonates somehow. We've seen something else that told us the same thing in a similar way. And we learned the lesson before, and this sounds consistent again. And then we become engaged because now we want to see if the outcomes match what we suspect might happen. Right? So I said, I can think of three shows that kind of match this storyline. The first one is a feature film that starred Sandra Bullock. And it was about 15 years ago where she went to rehab and she was a real problem. And she woke up in rehab. She'd been there before. And was she going to get her act together this time? Or is it going to be like the last time? Right. And she goes through this whole arc of getting clean and sober while she's in rehab. And so half of the movie is about waking up in rehab and getting clean. And then the second half of the movie is the challenge to her newfound sobriety. How do the friends react who knew, who knew her only as a crazy party animal? And how will they react to her once she is sober and responsive and, and normal, right? I thought also about Girl Interrupted uh, with okay. Angelina Jolie and Winona Ryder. Mm-hmm. When I wrote it, I, I thought of that movie. And uh, I think it was Jam- Jamaica. Um, she she commented me that um, she thought of Bojack Horseman when he oh, goes- Oh, right, I remember that. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, definitely. I love Bojack Horseman. So I was really glad to hear, to read that. That's funny. I'm not that familiar with Bojack Horseman, but what about um, Silver Linings Playbook? Mm. Guy goes to the nut house, right? Yeah. He has a psychotic break. He has a meltdown. His wife that he loves left him with no notice, no clue. Impacted him so badly, he snapped. Ends up in the rubber ranch for a while. They let him out halfway through. Well, not really halfway through, but about a third of the way through. They, he's out. And now it's about his family walking on eggshells. Is this guy going to go back to Snaptown and have to get recommitted? Or is he really healthy? Did he really learn his lesson? And then we see his arc of learning how to be, learning how to be not in a caustic dependent relationship. Right. Yeah. A toxic relationship. So he's on an arc of learning. So at the end of the movie, his elixir is his elixir is the girl yeah. that his dance partner, he ends up falling in love with her and realizing that her love represents the genuine love that he didn't have the first time. So yeah. his ordinary world in the beginning of the movie that shattered by the end of the movie became inconsequential to the prospect of new love and redemption. Right. So his arc is clearly redemption. Right. So and then I can also think of one other, which is maybe a little bit more obscure. And that was the pilot of the Sopranos. I think I think I haven't seen that. Tony Soprano is a gangster and he's done very bad things. And his mind starts to snap on him and he goes to therapy and he's in therapy for the entire series dealing with reconciling two lives, the life of a gangster and the life of a family man with kids and a wife and what appears to be a normal life. And then what he does at night, which is popping guys and, you know, running games and gambling and, and the criminal underworld. 
and he's leading a life of duality and he, he can't reconcile it. And so he's constantly trying, trying, trying. And because it's a TV series, he doesn't get better until the very end in the very last episode. And, and we don't know if he gets better because he was killed or if he gets better because he just stopped worrying about it anymore. And he just let it go. We don't know because it ends in a very strange way, which is the subject of a lot of intellectual debate. But so there's three examples of, you know, the, the hero having to suffer or endure change. Their original world, for better or worse, was the one that they had and they were used to it. Something happens. They have to address the problem. They might seek advice from a mentor on how to handle the challenge. Then they embrace the challenge. They uh, are rewarded for their effort or they have examples of trial and error, success or failure, and then re-attempting, re-embracing the objective, and then da -da 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 through to the end to finding the elixir. So we can sort of back engineer almost any, any story you can think of and see how it fits into these, into these structures. And then I think the degree to which it fits into one of these structures, I think is some indication on how successful that story might be. Because we are, whether we believe it or not, preconditioned to accept these structures as part of our, how we relate to ourselves and to our society through these stories of morality or a parable or legend, symbolic legend. And that's the whole basis of Joseph Campbell's research. He's saying, we understand this in here but he's trying to give it a name. He's trying to, he's trying to identify it and then stratify it so that you can apply it with complete, you know, revelation and understanding. Right. And so, you know, that's what this guy was all about in the 19, 1954. I think he wrote this book, right. That was what Lahush was getting at the whole time. And his contemporary Kenneth Burke wrote something uh, in the academic world. He's approaching the, the arts, theater, film, mostly theater in his day. Kenneth Burke was approaching academics with the same argument, right? And, and Kenneth Burke wrote something about the rhetoric of drama, uh, which is a very interesting uh, argument that mirrors Joseph Campbell. Uh, and so, and then Vogler embracing it and writing the writer's journey, okay? Um, what do you guys think? Am I full of it? Am I making sense? Is any of this resonating with you? Does any of it appear helpful, valuable, or not? <laughs> it's very helpful so far. Yeah. I'm trying to have a conversation, but you guys aren't helping me very much. <laughs> I want to hear how you feel about these things. I want to know if it's, you know, uh, do you like the actually, idea? I do, have a I do have a question. Yeah. Um, this is relating more to the, the last assignment that we had. Which was uh, when, when I was say, looking yeah. at the the antag the antagonist's okay. opportunity, I was a bit like confused on that exactly. Um, well, so you've got two ways to look at your story, right? The mm -hmm. first thing we look at is who's the hero and what does he want, right? Yeah. And then presumably in the course of the story, there's going to be a conflict that you're going to identify: man versus himself, man versus man, man versus nature. And some would argue there's a fourth man versus society. I think man versus society is a bigger man versus man problem. So if we just go man versus man, man versus self, man versus nature, okay, establish the conflict. And then if it's man versus man, who's the antagonist? What does the antagonist want? What barrier does the antagonist represent to the protagonist? Right? Are they uh, a barbarian and a paladin that have to meet on the field of battle to determine who's right and wrong and, and wins the princess or the kingdom or whatever you know uh is it man versus nature bilbo and the dragon or is it man versus self right uh you know uh who mentioned it i think it was sean that mentioned american psycho right man versus himself yeah. what is it Right. So I'm asking you to, to tell me who your hero is and what your hero wants and what you think your hero's objective is or what his goal is. Right. So the antagonist opportunity, in a sense, is essentially what the, what divides between the hero and the antagonist. Well, yeah. Protagonist so like, and antagonist. 
let's think of Parsifal and the Black Knight, right? A classic story from King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Uh, uh, Parsifal is a virtuous knight of the realm. His ultimate objective is to find the grail, but he also has some pedestrian duties as well, which is defend the king or queen's honor, defend the realm against invaders, uh, and demonstrate uh, strength and ethics through symbolic gestures like jousting, right? And so uh, then we have this other character, the Black Knight. What does the Black Knight represent? The other. The Black Knight represents those who exist outside of the realm, who are not part of the community, not part of the ideology. A challenge to Parsifal's foundations of morality or ethical behavior. And what is so what does the Black Knight want? The Black Knight wants to deceit Parsifal. He wants to knock him down in the joust. By winning the joust, he symbolically shows superiority. And that is like saying, uh, might makes right. If I knocked you out of the saddle in a joust, I must be morally and ethically the superior ideology as well, because my faith has given me strength, right? This is how we can, I mean, if you really want to dissect it like that, this is where we could go with it. Um, I think it helps. I think it's a useful exercise because you can really start to get into what your characters are about and it might really help you demonstrate their conflict. You know, if you really know the point of view of the bad guy, let's say for lack of a better term, uh, and you feel like you understand the good guy, then every time they conflict, we're really going to be exposed to some very interesting conflict. We're really going to know what it means, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't know, try to apply that to uh, another topic like Luke and Vader, you know? Yeah. Ultimately, you know, it's suggested that it's man versus himself in the second movie where Luke goes into the tree and encounters the physical manifestation of his anxiety, which is facing Darth Vader. And when he kills Vader in the tree, it's possibly suggested that Vader is Luke. Luke is Vader. That's a symbolic representation of Luke's path towards the dark side if he's not careful. Right. But that, that metaphor of Vader in the tree has a, has a physical reality, which is the, the apple dark apple Anakin apple Skywalker. <laughs> well, yeah, well, there, so there's some tropes that uh, are consistent with this storyline, right? And mm -hmm. that, that's one of them. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Dad's uh, dad committed to the dark side. The kid's going to do the same thing, you know? Um, so, you know, you can almost, like I said, take your favorite movie and, and start dissecting it and see if these principles apply. I think you'll find that they do. Uh, and maybe that will help in some way. And it'll certainly reveal to you one universal truth. The folks writing stuff for Hollywood are following a pattern. And I'm suggesting to you that the pattern is revealed in these documents. And that you can embrace one of them and apply it and then turn it on its head. Uh, where is he? Oh, we don't have his picture. Sean is turning it on his head. He's got an internal conflict. The bad guy is the good guy. He is the tragic hero or the uh, antagonist uh, that we are encouraged to cheer on through a, some form of transition, perhaps. Uh, I keep thinking of Walter White in Breaking Bad. You know, Walter White is a teacher. Um, he's a family man. He's a father. Uh, he's also a notorious drug dealer. And even though he only took up cooking crystal meth because he thought he was dying of cancer, and he, oops, spoiler alert, he was trying to provide for his family, he's still a meth dealer. And he has to try and reconcile that with his other persona, which is solid, upstanding citizen, right? man versus himself, really. All the other things is kind of window dressing when he has to fight the other drug dealers for territory, when he has to deal with his partner who's off his rocker most of the time, right? Or he has to deal with 
you know, bigger drug dealers who want to consume the little fish and they want to make Walter work for them. You know, all of this stuff is kind of situational window dressing that helps us create a series out of a root concept, which is, is Walter going to figure out how to reconcile his two sides or is he going to have to pick one? And it kind of goes every other series at the end of every other season. Oh, at the end of this season, Walter's going to go back to normal. And then by the end of the next season, it's like, nope, Walter's gone over to the dark side. And then the end of the next season is like, oh, nope, he's back to be a good guy again. And then back to, you know, he goes back and forth, back and forth because they keep giving them money to make the series. So they got to keep spinning that situational wheel, that inciting incident and that resolution and keep doing this with him. 13 to 16 times a season for five seasons until you get to the end, you get to the culminating season and then, you know, things have to play out. So I took you a long way around the block on that, but I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Professor, um, I, I have an idea now. <laughs> yes, Hannah. Oh, um, for my story, I have four antagonists in it. So when I do the character dossier, should I just do it for the main, because technically the, I have two brothers as the main antagonist and I have two side antagonists. Let me ask you two key questions hmm. for you before I, okay. is there one antagonist that stands out as the leader or the spearhead of the objective? No, so I had, okay. I have, I have it as My other question is, do the four antagonists represent the same ideology? No, they were all going to have uh, the, the two side antagonists were going to have their own, and then the brothers were going to have one. Oh so there were going to be three reasons why they all were the antagonists. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. all different situations. Yes. And so your protagonist then has to suffer all of these ordeals in order yes. to be redeemed. Is it a redemption arc? Um, no, my story was the one where um, her, her parents get murdered she witnesses her parents murder and she gets rescued, but she has to get past the death, but she also tries to find who she is again after the death. And she gets help from her friends to figure out who are the antagonists. Cause she doesn't know who they are when they first murder her parents, they are uh, disguised. So she doesn't know who they are. So she spends the show trying to figure out who they are and she doesn't know the why she just witnesses the murder and let's go to the 36 dramatic situation shall we sure and let's see what we got it's definitely kin versus kin i heard kin versus kin in there ah. the number one supplication no deliverance yes or no deliverance think so no okay not crime pursued by vengeance not vengeance taken upon kin the kin didn't kill kin in your story right no okay so it's not really that pursuit eh, not so much disaster well there is a tragic death that's unexpected that could be construed as a disaster mm -hmm. so but i think disaster is more like the towering inferno or the poseidon adventure in, yeah. in that respect where disaster affects everybody in the story and they mm -hmm. all have a way of dealing with it so i it's probably not disaster in this context okay falling prey to cruelty or misfortune certainly death is misfortune especially when it's in your own family yeah. uh daring enterprise nah, abduction no enigma no <laughs> enmity of kin a malevolent kinsman a hated or reciprocally hating kinsman we have conflict between siblings, maybe. Rivalry of kin, certainly, right? Yeah. Doesn't sound like there's any adultery. No madness. No, no, no there's not. No. no fatal imprudence. So <laughs> slaying of kin unrecognized. No, that's more like Oedipus Rex. Right. Um, Self-sacrifice for an ideal? No. Self-sacrifice for kin. Does your protagonist win or lose? Um, at the very end, she does win. She okay. uh, so she, she overcomes. 
Right. She she overcomes everything at the very end of the, so the story. They win. So okay, well we got at least two in there. Right? So um so far, uh, you know, every time we we apply a storyline to these templates, we we're reaffirmed. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's proof positive that these things can work, they can help, they can guide. Um, you know, so that's good. That's, uh, so, that's really good. So for my dossier, should I just write it about the brothers then instead of doing it for all four? Should I just write it for? You could write it for the brothers. That's why I asked you if they all symbolize the same ideology. Right. Yeah. If they're yeah. all coming from the same, you know, they might offer different um, trials for the hero, but is in each case, are those trials based on the same objective? Because then you could treat them as a group uh, antagonist or just pick one, the one well, you think is the most compelling. Yeah, they, they have different reasons, but they all want the same objective. The, so, okay, I could just yeah. do it for the brothers then. And just it's pick one and use the ideology yeah. as the, yeah, as the overarching um, objective of the antagonist. Yeah, when, when I when I told my parents I was going to make three different villains, they went, I hope you understand what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, 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 I got it. So it's, it, it's, uh, it's definitely a trial on its own trying to figure out who is doing what for why. So that's, I think that's in your case, if you get the first conflict, right, mm -hmm. all you gotta do is repeat it two more times with the same sort of pattern, and apply the different circumstances to that and you'll just have a, a re, you know, a recyclical inciting incident with a resolution. Womp, womp, womp. So you'll have a five act structure, really. Begin, yeah. Middle, middle, middle and end resolution. Well, because really quickly, I was going to have the brothers do it because of their parents and her parents had something in the past that didn't work out. And so they're after her. And then the two different guys, they are not related, but they have instances where it happened with her, where they had a problem with her, they want their vengeance on her. So they found the brothers and then it just all kind of were like, okay, we're gonna do it all together. And then- Distill it down, distill it down, distill it down, right? Vengeance, you said it, yeah. vengeance. Mm -hmm. Yes. The antagonist's goal is vengeance. So yes. whether there's one or four, they mm -hmm. represent the same ideology, which mm -hmm. is you will pay for what you have done. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. There's your solution to page three. Just pick one then. They all represent the same objective, <laughs> vengeance. Okay. I will just pick one. And then the details really, uh, I think then the details kind of become easier to put together. Because if you know what these people are all about, then you know how they're going to act and what they're probably going to say. And then there's only a few ways that they're going to respond, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm trying to think really quickly off the top of my head if there's something that I could. Um, um, I'm thinking of like a story where a member of a group might have gotten killed and the rest of the group go on the hunt for who did it, right? And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, you know, everybody's objectives are clear, right? The hero mm -hmm. is dead in the first act. The supporting actors must then take on the objectives or, you know, take on the righteous uh, 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 task of, of revenge for the death of their beloved member of the group against the antagonists whose goals were what? We don't know. You can define that. Uh, rival gang? I don't know. Um, usually it's the situation where one group has something the other group wants, and so the other group attempts to take that away. And in doing so, it creates the conflict. And so the antithesis, the antagonists want what the heroes have, and the heroes are protecting what they have at all costs. And then there is inciting incident after inciting incident for as long as you want this conflict to go on until you pick your moment where you want to resolve it. Right. Something, you know, you're going to pick something that's going to happen. Romeo mm -hmm. and Juliet. There we go. Yeah. What happens? Uh, uh, the killing of Tybalt. <laughs> The two kids fall in love, but they're from rival families who are having a feud. Mm -hmm. uh, they have they have a secret bond. 
Uh, they know they're going to get discovered eventually. They try to hold off as long as they can and enjoy their ordinary world. And they refuse the call to adventure, which is admitting they're in love to their families and trying to resolve or repair the damage between the two families. But before that can happen, Tybalt finds out that Romeo has been dipping into the family and Tybalt goes after Romeo. Romeo kills Tybalt. The inciting incident is the hero from the good family kills the antagonist from the bad family and then wham, right? And then their resolution is they both kill themselves. So they lose in the end. But the objective was they wanted to be in love and they wanted to be together forever. And in some strange way, they fulfilled that objective. They just did it by committing suicide. Professor summer Moore. but you know yeah. kind of fits yes yeah, ma'am yeah. sorry um i have a meeting for another class at three yeah so. i ran over anyway i'm blabbing off so <laughs> technically technically we are done for the day but if you want to see this thing through we can do it or we can adjourn you're certainly free to uh, meet your yes, obligations. i have an important meeting for a project at three but thank you so much did definitely this definitely helps me out a lot and thank you all who who gave some feedback and thank you for so for sharing thank you very much appreciate it bye-bye bye-bye uh anybody else have anything to offer or toss out to the group or we can adjourn for the day uh i had like a question just like out of curiosity yes all right uh I was kind of thinking about it and is it like is it possible that you can make a show without there being like any point to it like there's really no like man versus anything or all that Seinfeld it's a show about nothing <laughs> <laughs> but but even Seinfeld has this structure to it it's really really hard sometimes to figure out what that structure is and I think because Seinfeld is, is episodic and not serialized, each episode exists under its own auspices in terms of story. So the stories don't have to interconnect. It's merely the same characters in the same world from week to week, but their conflict or their story differs from week to week. So it's not a, an interconnected story at that point. And so every week you gotta kind of figure out what the arc is, you know. Um, and it could be just about anything. Um, but the one thing about humor, I think, is um, I think sometimes humor can heal a lot of issues with a storyline by virtue of the humor, if the humor is really hitting home, you know. Um, but I can't really think of an example that lacks definitive structure other than maybe something like Seinfeld it's pretty close but I think even Seinfeld has structure I'm sure Larry David would insist that it does um I've never really watched Seinfeld but I was thinking more along the lines like it kind of sounds like the show uh it's always sunny in Philadelphia because I was trying to think about it and I don't think it has structure you've seen it talking about the new version of it's always sunny because I'd say you haven't heard of Seinfeld but you heard of it's always sunny in Philly because the original always sunny in Philly predates Seinfeld I believe <laughs> um, but yeah that's the same I think that's the same kind of thing it's just silliness the point is they get together and they throw the characters into some random thing and then we get to watch the characters flounder around you know and maybe they succeed at their objective and maybe they don't the only real point seems to be to get the audience to laugh um, and so they have, you know, a very loose fitting context or storyline uh, to give you so that, you know, they can have some kind of structure to follow, even if it's only for the virtue of the filmmakers themselves. Um, but it seems like sometimes the real, the only real point is for you to laugh at these characters every week. You could be right about that. I think comedy is about the only place we might find that because, well, let me ask you this. Do you think that you could pull off a drama that had no point? No. Yeah. 
Yeah, probably not. I'm wondering if that's why they say, oh, I just had an idea. <laughs> I wonder if that's why they say comedy is, is really harder than drama, because I think comedy offers some complexities that drama can't do. Because if, if you don't adhere to some kind of structure fairly early on so that the audience can follow your story um, and anticipate outcomes and sort of root for the winner or the, the good guy or the bad guy, I think you lose in drama without structure. But in comedy, I think as long as people are laughing, they're going to keep watching. So then how would you end a comedy? I do. <laughs> uh a punchline you know at the end of every week you know what's the punchline they run you through a series of scenarios and they the the responses or the the demonstration gets more and more absurd and you're just laughing your butt off and then at the end of 23 minutes you get the punchline and then the credits roll and and you know you feel good about watching the show this week and you look forward to next week Every joke has a punchline. Eventually, if you're doing it right, I think. I don't know. Tell me I'm wrong. Somebody say, Professor Walsh, with all due respect, you're full of it. You know, um, I, mean, would I, would okay. <laughs> I mean, if you're ending a comedy, you could probably just make a ton of callbacks to previous episodes and end on, you know, one super punchline, if you will. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know that there's a rule that says you can't do it that way. Mm. I love not necessarily templates, but I, I certainly love um, or, or love taking inspiration from other successful artifacts like, you know, a, another comedy show if I'm running a comedy or, you know, a similar story arc or storyline or similar character if I'm doing a drama um, because it kind of gives you um, a pattern that, you know, that you can sort of follow that, you know, will, will resonate with your audience. Um, or, you know, the, uh, the other approach is, you know, living on the edge of the envelope and coming up with stuff that nobody's, nobody's looked at before. That's harder, I think, to find though. But when you do find it, hopefully, you know, if you understand structure, uh, you can apply it even when you are operating off the grid, when you are in uncharted territory. Maybe that's another value in story structure if you understand it well enough, is even though you can't see the path ahead of you, if you understand what the structure might be and what the possible outcomes might be based on your approach, you can sort of feel your way in the dark, right? And you can blaze that path. Anybody you got anything else? Should we adjourn then since it is uh, 305? I have a second and a third motion on my motion to adjourn. All right, folks, then uh, I'm gonna stop my screen share. I'm gonna thank you very much for your time. Don't forget we have uh, Betty Goldberg on Thursday, uh, come bearing questions. And you guys should be all turning in by the end of this week. I should have your beat sheets and your treatments and your dossiers. Okay, cool. Well then, thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for sharing. And I'll see you all on Thursday. Good one. Thank you, Professor Walsh. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. I just had one question. Yes. Um, um, so the character dossiers, I saw in web courses, it's due tonight, but you said it, we can. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. The dossiers are tonight and the other two are on the 5th, which is, I think. Okay. Friday, right? Yeah, I think the workshop is Friday. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah. Good? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Professor Walsh. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.